Let's get this started. The buzz. The buzz is on. I'm super excited. To get the buzz. There's a buzz in Sydney. There's a buzz. Okay, everyone, we're going to start here. You hear people outside, they're still buzzing. <laughs> Paul's gone out to call it. Call it all angels. Call it all angels. Walk me through this world. Don't leave me alone. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Paul. We were calling the angels in from the kitchen. Okay, we have our friend, what's our friend, Who, Nick. what's your name from, uh, Nick. Nick, Nick from New Zealand, the Kiwis have joined us, the Kiwis are alive and well here, he's amazing, he's joining us through the, we are living in a digital world, <laughs> Our digital selves are joining, Nick. <laughs> it's all one mind, right? Uh, yeah, that's right. And to me, it's great. Nick's right here with us, and it's with Skype video. It's it's like he's he's just just in the, as much in the room as as any of us. It's our quantum reach has reached all the way to to New Zealand. And before we started this movie, we did a live streaming periscope from the from the kitchen so uh, with periscope you just it's just we clicked on we hit the broadcast button and no uh, word going out ahead of time about it it was just a spontaneous thing let's do it and so uh, like over uh, was two hundred three over 300 people joined us spontaneously from around the world Probably a lot of them from over in this time zone, because the other ones are probably sleeping. But uh, it was kind of fun, because that we're sharing that, and it's just another symbol of minds are connected. And what they call real time, which is just the simultaneity of the present moment, and us joining in the, the joy and the happiness of this. So, Okay, we can open up. Any Anyone have any topics or anything? Yes? Question. Question. Uh, it's about my personal experience with the Course in Miracles. Um, the Course in Miracles came to me only in October last year by Divine Guidance. I've been very, very blessed. I, came, I was born with many of the teachings in the book that are very familiar to me since, yeah, since I was born. And I've always been guided by Spirit um, throughout my life. Not on a daily basis, but I'm always being very happy and trusting and knowing that my father takes care of everything for me. And for me, Jesus has always been my brother. Mm -hmm. uh, no, my God, but my brother. <laughs> He's my, my, my cool brother. And um, <coughs> then when I got the Course in Miracles, uh, I've been reading it, and it's very beautiful. And I started reading it, and I, I, at the beginning I was sort of... Um, not liking it, but I knew it was good, and I thought it was fantastic. But the words that the book says sometimes is like you, uh, like almost like pointing a finger, <laughs> like you decided to be separate from God. And I was like, no, I'm not. I'm not separate from God, and stuff like that. And then, then through the book, I'm now only in chapter 19 or 18, because I keep going back and forth, back and forth, and as as I guided to go and read. And then I've been having some experiences that are like very long and I go back to sort of unlearn what I had already learned of being in oneness. And I end up falling back into ego. And I don't understand why is that happening because I'm very happy, very trusting, very connected. <coughs> Fantastic things happen to me. And then I go on to one of the lessons, whichever. And then I go, oh, I don't... I don't have this, what am I going to do? I, like, I don't have that problem, or I don't have that. And then I go, no, babe, maybe I have to, to go back into it. And then I fall into a very deep, low space, and I become very aware of my split mind. And it's me, 
my mm-hmm. I guess my my true self and my projection of myself and I was like <laughs> and I'm like no that's that's not real they don't even exist you know like yeah. what is like, <laughs> like that yeah. and then I have like very uh, dark moments and I'm just calling to the Holy Spirit and Jesus and come on I don't accept this I know this is not real why is this happening and am I doing something wrong am I forcing myself to go back into learn something that I had already unlearned well that's my question about the the book am I I was very hesitant to read it as well at the beginning because the way it came to me was I was asking God for three days non-stop guide me to the highest, purest, wisest divine guidance. And then, oh, I always get what I ask. And so I was directed to see a woman uh, on YouTube that she channels Jesus. And it's a medium, uh, not a channel. And I've been like, I don't like channels, I don't like that, mm-hmm. because of the Bible, I want to have it that. But the spirit was, not. you have to listen, you have to listen. And I listened all the messages. And then in the messages came that she had published a book, the autobiography of Jesus, that Jesus dictated. And I read it in a week, and it was so beautiful. And in the book, he's saying, I dictated the Course in Miracles, you need to read it. And I was like, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> and then get, I insisted so much that I end up reading the book. Yeah. But I feel, am I doing something? Am I forcing myself to go back into places that I don't need to go? Or do I need to go to these places again because maybe I left something... I'm done, so, yeah. Okay, I hope, did everyone hear the question okay? I think this is almost a continuation of Frank's question, because Frank was talking about the, the there's, it's just the unconscious mind and, and resistance that's down there, and so, um, for many people, I get to meet so many people all over the world in so many different cultures and traditions, so I get to hear their stories. And there are quite a few people I meet that that are they're very like guided, as you feel very, feel very blessed, feel like there's been all these synchronicities, and I'm cared for by my loving father, and you know they really feel that way too. And then what a Course in Miracles does is it's literally like taking you through the darkness to the light. So, the only thing that you've been missing, and the only thing that a lot of these people that are talking about this kind of life of, of cared for by Abba Father and, and so forth, is, is constancy. In other words, the definition of a split mind is, is a mind that's unaware of the constancy of God's love. And, and love has to be constant to be what it itself is. So, what we're realizing is, is that you, it's almost like um, if you're cleaning up a, a, a place or a house or something and you realize there's, there's rooms that you haven't been in yet or there's areas of the mind that are out of awareness that you haven't been found yet, that those are part of a prayer. Really your prayer is, I want to know you fully, I want to serve you fully, I want to be one with you and that's pushing up the, the unconscious into the conscious, and then the mind will do all kinds of flips, like am I going backwards, am I going forwards, am I, am I making this too complicated, am I, you know, am I doing something wrong, that's a common thing that comes up, and everything's always going right, yes. and, and this, even when the darkness is coming up, those are things that that are having to be That's what I keep telling myself. No, yes. this is, you know. Right. Like the two <laughs> fingers, right? <laughs> 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 this one is the one saying constant, and love is always with me, and I'm always love, and it's impossible to be otherwise. But then it's just this other thing. It's yeah. Like, yeah. Mm-hmm. You're doing, she's doing a puppet show. Maybe you can, for our, for our friend over there in New Zealand, you could just stick your fingers in the puppet, because he's, he's here. One puppet, then a puppet. There. It's the two puppets that are going, <laughs> he's pretty saying thank you. Because that's, that's the definition of a, of a split mind, you know, where there's two parts. Yeah. One part that mm-hmm. remembers the truth, and then one part that has completely denied the truth, and has gotten into complete amnesia. So it's completely blocked it out of awareness. And that's the thing, even if you have lots of miracles, and a whole lot of miracles, and then you get into a doubt thought, that doubt thought is like a black cloud that blocks 
as if you never had any miracles. As if you've been having all these miracles for years and all of a sudden the dark thought comes over and it's like, as if it's gone. And, and as if there's a doubting part that's going, uh oh, what, what's this? I've never felt this before. But it's, it's just the block. So, uh, it reminds me too of when I first came across A Course in Miracles and I felt that big wave of love and I, I just felt so much love and gratitude. And I remember at that point, I was in California and I was saying, Okay, God, point me to the nearest mountain, I'm ready to ascend. And it was almost like there was all these angels laughing at the same time, like, Ha oh, ha, cute! Ha oh, he thinks he's ready to ascend. <laughs> and they all were laughing and laughing and laughing and then it was like, you're at the beginning. It's like the beginning of like the alphabet A to Z. You're not at Z, you're at A. <laughs> you, you are just starting. Which is, which is the way it is for all of us because it's humbling to start to open up to the idea that if love is constant, and I've never experienced it as constant, then I might have had glimmers and lots of, of reflections of it, but I don't know the actuality of it. Which is very humbling. When you think of it, to wake up every day, to open your eyes and say, ah, another day of forgiveness. Uh, and then if you're confident enough, you open your eyes and you say another day of forgiveness, then you can say to the Holy Spirit and Jesus, bring it on. Uh, you can do the Pat Benatar, hit me with your best shot, come on, hit me with your best shot, fire away. <laughs> Now, if you're confident enough to do that with the Holy Spirit, <laughs> you may have a very interesting life, that's all I will say. Because that's, a, that's like a willingness, you're saying, I am willing to heal. I will do whatever it takes. I am not wanting to linger in time. I want, I'm wanting to know my home in eternity. I'm wanting to connect with, with what is real, what is absolutely real. So, the good thing about it is, is that the Course, that's very common for many people that the Course comes into their lives and, and the overall consistency and quality of their life first seems to take a hit. And I remember Louise Hay one time saying, using the metaphor, uh, in the United States we have this holiday called Thanksgiving where they roast a turkey and they stuff the turkey and everything. Well, she said that spiritual journey is like uh, cleaning a turkey pan after Thanksgiving. Oh. You, you, it's you know it's all baked on and there's gunk stuck to the side and this and this and it's very dirty, greasy, dark and so forth. She said you fill it with water, you throw in all the soap and then you scrub and scrub and scrub and scrub, and you're going to have to go through a lot before that turkey pan is clean. And, she said, when you throw the water in and the soap, it's going to get a lot dirtier before it gets clean. Which, I thought that was great advice from Louise Hay. Because, we're, we're facing, we're, we want Spirit to be realistic with us. We don't want the Spirit to like sugarcoat it and, oh, it's all going to be lolly, beautiful, and roses and sweet smells. Tell me, to, give it to me straight. So, my prayer with A Course in Miracles and with with a spiritual awakening was, I was basically saying to Jesus, give it to me straight. I want it straight. Even if it's harsh, I want it straight. And so when I said that and I opened the book to the Manual for Teachers, I noticed that the stages of development of trust that I was talking about are in there, that you have to go through these stages before you wake up. And I started looking at those stages very closely, and I noticed that four out of the six, two-thirds of the stages that we all have to go through are dark. Two-thirds. And that, I was like, whoa, that's, that was sobering. But again, that was an answer to a prayer, like, give it to me straight. Like, this is a path of through the darkness to the light. This is not a path of just affirming light and love. If you really affirm light and love, and you really, that's the prayer of your heart, that you want the experience of light and love, then everything that's blocking you from the light and love must come from the unconscious mind up into awareness. And 
is really just coming up to move through, almost like clouds just moving through. There's, there's really no need to attach to any of it, but, but usually the, the mind's in this habit of starting to judge and condemn itself based on what it's experiencing and feeling. When you feel the dark thoughts of, of upset, fear, pain, anger, jealousy, envy, all those thoughts, you are feeling the ego's feelings. Those are not actually your feelings. They never have been your feelings. Because you weren't created to feel in that way. You were created to be. You are a being. And you were created in love and light to experience joy and happiness, freedom, stillness, silence, divine silence. That, that is part of our, what we were given in our creation. And so when you feel the ego's feelings, it, it must mean that you're thinking with the ego. You're still thinking with the ego thoughts. And also underneath those thoughts, you're believing in those thoughts. And you might say that belief is something, there are no beliefs in heaven, but, but in the separated state, it's all come about from belief. And the good news is, is there actually, out of all those trillions of beliefs, there actually is one helpful belief. There's a needle in the haystack. There's one helpful belief out of all those trillions of beliefs, and that's forgiveness. It's still an illusion, because there's no beliefs in heaven, but it's the one that takes you home. And that's why, imagine one belief that will work, and all the trillions of others that won't. And Jesus described his pathway to heaven in the Bible as the straight and narrow. Well, one out of a trillion <laughs> is pretty straight and narrow. It just seems like that's why it takes so much time to find that. But there's actually a workbook lesson where he says, you know, salvation is a thought that is in your mind. Find it, he says. <laughs> so we're on a journey to find that needle in the haystack. So for me, at that point I thought, well okay, then that's simply the purpose of life. I'm not to achieve, accumulate, its success in terms of how the world defines it and, and describes it, but actually to go for that salvation that's in the mind. Go for that peace. And once you start to give your mind over to it, that's when more and more things just start to come your way. You need to meet people, see videos, come across books, come across quotes. Uh, even your Facebook page, your, your profile may start to change. You start to feel things, experience this connection, and you start to write about it, or post links to it, or whatever. Notice that your friends start to change. Some friends fall away. They, they are not part of your vibration, in terms of where your mind's at. It can be quite a, a conversion, where some just start to disappear. It's not a problem when people even disappear from your awareness, in the sense that you can be sure that everyone who seems to come and go from your life and your life's awareness, is, it's all part of a meaningful plan. There are no accidents, there's nothing random. You don't have to be concerned about losing friends, it's more like you want to put your focus on to becoming friendly. <laughs> Being friendly, having a friendly state of mind, not trying to collect friends. In fact, if you had a choice of losing all your friends, and, and then being friendly, <laughs> wouldn't you make that, that choice? Because then you would be friendly with everyone and everything that you meet. Every animal, every person, even every, every fly. Yeah. Imagine, and there, maybe they have flies down here, like we have them up there. Imagine yeah. being friendly with a fly. One time Kirsten and I, went to this, we at this place and we were meditating and she was sitting over across from me and she was meditating and I was meditating and then this fly came in the room and it was just buzzing around and it just decided to keep landing on Kirsten and on her nose and <laughs> on her cheeks and on her, her thighs and her, on her arms and everything. And then she raised an eye and look at the fly and the fly would go off and come back and land on the skin again and she'd look at it again. The fly was getting her to open her eyes during her meditation and pay attention to the fly. 
And so this continued for a while. I was doing an open-eyed meditation, so I was beholding the whole thing. And uh, then finally, uh, this continued on for four or five minutes. Finally, she just reached over and she got a, a piece of, uh, like a newspaper or magazine, and began to roll it up and make a fly swatter. And the fly flew away when she got the fly swatter. Then the fly flew over and landed on my knee, and then just turned and watched her with her fly swatter paper from my knee. And I was like, can you believe that? She would actually think of swatting me, you know. It was like I was watching. It's all our mind. It's all our mind. And, and our mind wants to be free of attack. It wants to be free of, of threat. It wants to be free of fear. Fear is very unnatural to our mind. We weren't created to be fearful beings. And so it's just a purification, it's a purge of the fear. And the best way to free your mind of fear is through miracles. In fact, Jesus says that miracles are your preparation to make your mind ready for revelation. Like you're too frightened of the light right now. It would be like if the light came into your awareness, it would be like destroying, like a giant light sentinel destroying your perceptual world. And the light is not destructive. The light doesn't even know what destruction is, so you have to open to it. You have to come to it on its terms. You need miracles, actually many miracles, to prepare your mind for that revelatory state. You will not be hurled into reality. You're not going to be hurled into mystical states until you're ready for them. But you can practice on a daily basis of cleaning and clearing the the judgments, the debris away. And how do you clear out judgments? Well, Jesus says you let, have to allow judgments through you rather than by you. In other words, the by you is the ego, just judging and interpreting everything. The through you is guidance. When you get guidance to call somebody, to go visit somebody, to go on a retreat, to go uh, on a seminar, to take a vacation with somebody, to write a letter to somebody and express your love, to all the different ways that we can communicate, that's guidance. That's the Holy Spirit's use of the physical, what seems to be physical images, words, images, sending a poem, sending a painting, having a dance, like Mel, Mel's dances are like meditation, moving meditations. It's all part of Clearing the debris in your mind so that you can be ready for that light, for that mystical experience. And to me, that's the most gentle, gradual way to go at this. And that's why when I first opened up to A Course in Miracles, I thought, how practical. This is a practical book that's basically saying, uh, it's good to study it, but don't push it. It's good to practice the lessons, but do it lightly. Do it gently, do it softly. Take one lesson a day, which is really not complicated, and just as best you can, carry it like a torch through the day. Go about your regular activities. If you've promised people something, fulfill your promises. Live in integrity. You know, go through your day and do what you're doing, whether it's, it's with a job, whether it's child care, whether it's it's building something, working on a project, or working in a garden, or whatever it seems to be, you can practice tuning into spirit and giving it over to spirit for whatever you're doing. And to me, that's a practical spirituality. It's not saying you necessarily have to go live in a cave. It's not saying you necessarily have to be celibate, or that you have to fast 40 days, or that your diet has to be this way or that way. Those can all become disciplines, just like exercise can be a discipline, yoga can be a discipline. Practicing A Course in Miracles is a discipline of not beating yourself up when you're doing those lessons. Not being harsh on yourself when you miss a practice period. When he says, we'll, we'll have four practice periods today and, and you get three of them and then suddenly it's, you're falling asleep and you go, oh, sorry, four just disappeared there. You, and it can be an oops, it can be like, try again, we'll try again tomorrow, you know, like you would if you were dealing with a child in a very loving way. If a child falls down, you don't scold the child, you pick the child up 
in a very loving, gentle way, and you encourage the successes. We're asked to do the same with our mind training, and be very encouraging with our successes. And by that means, when we start to have stretches of peaceful, feeling peaceful and light and joyful, think, oh wow, this is good, I feel that's been a very productive day. Not in terms of what I accomplished in the world, but, but if I'm having a happy day, that's a wonderful thing to celebrate. And then to move on, and to continue on. So, it's definitely a course in mind training, and any spiritual tradition or deeply religious tradition uh, has discipline. And we all know that from, from our educations we had to discipline ourselves. Not that all of us were just born studiers. Oh, I can't wait to study. Yeah, but I'd rather study than go out and walk, take a walk on a sunny day, or go swimming, or go sailing, or something. We had to discipline ourselves, even with our careers, even with our jobs, our skills, parenting skills. All the things we've done have taken a certain amount of concentration and focus. So we can't expect that the course is going to be different. That somehow we're going to get it through osmosis by putting it under our pillow. You know, we, we actually have to actively apply it. For me, I love the metaphysics of the Course, but I have to say that the thing that excited me the most about A Course in Miracles was its practicality. That, that instead of having to sit for long stretches in the day, or, or change the form and go live in an ashram, or go live in an isolated, in a forest or whatever, that I could practice every day with every person I met and everything I was doing. I could contemplate, I could focus, I could direct my thoughts more and more the way I was instructed, and feel a momentum building with that. And then more momentum, and like, okay, oh good, this is good, I'm getting it. I'm feeling more peaceful, and feeling the transfer of training. I'm feeling it in seeming emergencies or trying times, and also during just peaceful, relaxing times, I've started to spread, spread out. It's feeling like it's transferring. And, and we learn from each other. That's why it is helpful to be able to share what we're doing, what we're going through and experiencing with our brothers and sisters. To be able to, to share our miracles. And also to share the, the times when our heart is heavy and when we're having despair and difficulty. You know, to be, feel safe enough and feel a safe enough environment and enough trust that we can start to open up about those. Which undoes the belief that we're on our own somehow, that we have to personally figure out a way to handle with this darkness and this heaviness. To me, that's that's the likeness of having mighty companions. That's the likeness of, of having a shared purpose. Or even when they say like-minded friends, those that are really interested in spiritual awakening. Now there's a lot of concern about, well, will I have to leave my family, or will I have to leave my friends to go on this journey, or whatever. Remember that the people of the world are just reflections of your thought. And there are no set distinctions. We can't make hard and fast rules for how this has to go and how it has to look in form. It can be, I, I always enjoyed uh, Paramahansa Yogananda, Autobiography of a Yogi. And one of Yogananda's teachings was that he, Yogananda actually came out and cautioned against friendship. Cautioned against friendship unless those friends were truly devoted to the Lord. Imagine if you went through your closet and you had to clean your clothes out, <laughs> and you thought, this one is no longer, I don't wear that, I haven't worn it in months, I'm not, it's just taking up space in my closet. Imagine if you do that with your life. Friends, family members, anyone. It was fascinating to me that Yogananda cautioned against friendship unless they were devoted to the Lord. And I would say what he was doing is he was saying, you've got to build your spiritual momentum. You've got to see the worthiness of this purpose of forgiveness. You've got to see how valuable this waking up is. We've placed value in a lot of things in this world, where we get locked into 
contracts and relationships and we feel like we're, we're all tied down, uh, we're all trapped and tethered to the world with all these obligations and duties and responsibilities, but it's like we have to start to say, what is it for? Does this truly serve my awakening? Just like if you went through your clothes in the closet and you were saying, do I really wear these clothes anymore? Why am I keeping around, hanging things around that I'm not using? Oftentimes that's a good time for us to clear out and clean out. And we can do that with thoughts, we can do that with relationships. We're not trying to, you know, make a, draw a line about, I'm just going to be friends with some and not with others. Because we do want to be friendly to everyone. We want to have a cultivated attitude of friendliness, of integrity, of respect, of honesty. And we also realize that we're going through a sorting out in our mind. The Holy Spirit is sorting out the, the valuable from the valueless, the true from the false. No human being can make that distinction. The persona is a mask that's drawn over the face of, of our true reality, of the light. So the persona is not capable of deciding what's going to serve in the awakening and not. It's the Holy Spirit. It's reliance on the Holy Spirit. But when you start to really look at your life and you look around you and you say, what is it that really serves my awakening, then that is a different set of priorities. And, and you might say it will reconfigure your life. So how does this play out in the parable of David? Well. I remember one point, I started to get a little hint of this, like some big changes were coming in my consciousness and in my perceived world, and, and I basically started to go deeper with the Course and deeper and deeper, and I had a set of family and friends, and basically I read to Jesus and I said, um, I still have quite a few conflicted relationships and I don't know how to to solve it. That's a pretty common thing on planet Earth. You have these certain relationships that they just dog you, they, they hang at you. It's like a bulldog that's got a hold of your genes and you do everything you can and the bulldog is it just, it is not letting go. It's just got jaws and it's, it's clenched in there and you can't get the bulldog off your genes. But we've had that with relationships and so I was saying to Jesus, I need some help here. A healing of relationships, and you might say healing the specialness of relationships is really what my prayer was. And Jesus said, well, it's like a card game. I said, card game? What card game? War? Mm -hmm. And he said, no, it's not that card game. It's 52 card pickup, uh, where, you know, you have to throw all the cards on the floor. So he actually had me go get a deck of cards, so he could, I could really understand what is he talking about. This is the last card game, I think he would, 52 card game, so I throw all the 52 cards on the floor. And I looked down at the cards on the floor and he said, now those are all the relationships that you currently have in your life. I said, okay, alright, and he said, and the ego dealt every one of them. Why? Because they all are separate, they all have their own likes, dif dislikes, minds of their own, temperaments. Um, yeah, it's a hodgepodge, it's the human condition. The, those 52 cars, and those relationships are representative of, of the conditions in my life. And he said that when you came to this world, it wasn't God that dealt those people, it was the Holy Spirit. That, that will heal you, your mind, but it was the ego that actually dealt them. All the preferences, you pick your parents, your siblings, your teachers, all these encounters that you seem to have in what you called your earth life, and it's all been specialness. Specialness dealt the deck. And I said, okay, so what's the solution for this now? And he said, well, 52 card pick up. Pick them up. Pick them all up. Pick every last one up. And get them back in the deck. And bring the deck to me. So, there's actually some of the cards I tried to hide. Like, uh, slip one, my grandmother in particular. I, I really enjoyed that card. She was so unconditional loving. 
I was like, I don't think the ego dealt her out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she's been like a beacon of light, and, and he was very specific, like, don't hide your grandmother in your pocket. <laughs> uh, you think I can't see that? Uh, I, the instructions were, bring all the cards back to the deck. And so, okay, and then, what? hand me the deck, so hand me the deck. And then, Jesus said, now I will do the dealing. I will deal from now on. You've got a free, a clean, fresh start on planet Earth. All those relationships, you've just handed them back to me. They belong in my hands. The healing is not going to occur until they're back in my hands. But I can deal in a way that you, I can lead you back to the Kingdom of Heaven. I can deal reflections of the love and the light and I had a lot of questions at that point. I'm like, well, am I going to see some of these cards that I've just given back to you? That I, what about my mom and my dad, and, you know, and his sister and this and this? And he said, well, he said it may be a little startling and surprising to you uh, which ones come. But remember, we're not using your past learning anymore. We're not using your ego in this dealing. It's the spirit dealing witnesses to the truth of you. <coughs> Spirit dealing those in which you can see the Christ in you, that you can look past the form and see the, the innocence, see the true essence of who they really are and who you really are. Because the only way you're going to go back to heaven is to come back to this innocence. You have to, just in one person, if you can just see one person with no past, if you can just see one, the Christ in one person, it will transfer to all the rest of the deck. All you have to do is, is achieve this with one person and you've done it for the whole deck. So it's not a cumulative thing. You don't have a burden on you to try to forgive and forgive and forgive and forgive and work your way back. No, it's the grace of God. It's just through one graceful moment of seeing that you were completely mistaken about who you thought they were. You have to let go of their history. You have to let go of everything. Jesus even has guided meditations in the Course, you know. Think of someone who's harmed you, or who treated you badly. You have thought of him, <laughs> he says, and, like, God, we got zeroed in, you know. How did you know I thought of him? You know, he's right there with you, you know. He, it's all designed by the Master to take you back into this innocence. So, so in one sense, that's what we're talking about. The, sometimes Christians call it a born-again moment, it's actually a moment where you surrender over trying to deal the deck. You surrender trying to control the relationships. You surrender trying to be the architect of your own life in form. And something in your heart cries out, I would rather be happy and free than be the architect of the designer of the, my form and of life in this world. I would rather be clueless about the world and cared for. I would rather be carefree and happy. Uh, I would rather be like a flower offering my fragrance up to everyone and everything instead of deciding who gets what and what it's going to bring for me. You know, that getting mechanism. So we're going through a purification where we're just basically handing over. However our life has gone, it, it is shown to us anew. There was a friend of mine who, um, I was going to go to Communist China, and he had lived and worked in China, and he, he knew seven different languages, and I said, it would be great to have on this trip to China, because <laughs> you speak Mandarin and everything. So he came to me, and when he lived and worked in Shanghai, he was part of a very cutthroat business, a very highly competitive, stressful, cutthroat business. And then when he went with me this time, when we were going around shining our light, speaking about Course in Miracles, the Spirit, Oneness, Awakening, Non-Duality, around to these different cities and everything, and he was there helping do some translations and help filming and using his many skills. He worked for the BBC and had many skills. We were one time, we were sent, because there's so much censorship over there, we went to a group that was kind of a hidden group where they were meeting around spirituality, but they, they didn't really tell anybody because they didn't want the government to kind of come and break it up. We went to that group, and when we came out, 
we were in the city of Shanghai, and we were in the very same neighborhood where this man had lived and worked in his cutthroat business. And he just burst into tears. Almost like when Helen Shekman took down A Course in Miracles, that when it came to A Course in Miracles version of the Lord's Prayer, Helen Shekman just burst into tears. Because it was this deep passage that she just was overwhelmed with love. And she couldn't not cry. She had to cry. He burst into tears and he just looked at me and he says, you, this is the same place where I had this past life of being this cutthroat businessman, and now I'm back here in this holy purpose. And the holy purpose was so strong that he burst into tears, he couldn't hold back. The Holy Spirit was simply retranslating this neighborhood in Shanghai, and he couldn't, out of all of Shanghai, to come back to the very same neighborhood. He couldn't miss the symbol. It was like Spirit saying to him, now I make all things new. Now you are forgiven. Now you are free. Now you have a new purpose that doesn't have anything to do with that life that you thought was you. You are reborn. You are new. That's where the tears kept coming and coming. And really, every day of every, and every instant, we have this opportunity to just trust and say, show me the way. And I just met uh, two friends, was it Angie and Laura, that are coming to Mudgee, and I miss them, they're just going there now, but um, Angie's been dealing with um, diagnosis and symptoms and so forth, but she's just, we had a moment down in Frankston, down in the Mornington Peninsula, where we just looked into each other's eyes and I was just saying, you're taking a trip, and isn't it wonderful that the purpose of your trip is to have Jesus show you the way? to lift the veils off your eyes, to show you the way back to this divine innocence. That every day you can wake up with your friend as you're traveling through Australia, and you can greet the brand new day with, show me, show me the way. Free of the past, free of concerns of what was before. Brand new, show me, every day, show me, show me. That's the attitude that we're asked to take. And you ever notice that about, about small children, how small children have a lot of curiosity. And you notice that when you get to be an adult, the, the curiosity starts to fade. And then when you wake up in the day, you just go through the motions. You, you brush your teeth, you get dressed, you've got this agenda rolling in your mind of what you, what you have to go through, what you have to do, who you have to meet. And this sense of time has become so embedded that you don't have that curiosity of, Mommy, what's that? Mommy, what's that? Daddy, what's that? You know, that show me, I'm curious attitude. That the best way you can approach A Course in Miracles is to come with curiosity, to come with that show me. I don't know, but you do, so you show me. I come as a child, I come as one that needs instruction. If any of us had the faintest hint of, of how helpful it could be to follow instructions and to follow this divine guidance, then we would suddenly put all of our energy into that venture of, of listening and following. We would suddenly pull it away from all the things that we've diluted our energy with. It's almost like we've, we've focused our energy in so many ways, it's like a rainbow of different ways, that we, we feel depleted, we feel half-hearted. Even with the Course sometimes there's a half-hearted feeling, like, okay, uh, oh yeah, I didn't do my lesson. Gotta find a book and do my lesson. As if somehow it's something is thrust upon us. I've had people that have even said, um, I got, I've got trouble with the workbook because I, I don't like to have somebody tell me what I'm to do <laughs> during the day. I, I like to spend my days the way I like to spend my days. And I don't really need somebody kind of intruding upon that. And that's the whole ego belief system. The ego is like saying, listen, you've thrown away heaven and nirvana, so face it. 
You're stuck in time and space now, so you better make the best of it. <laughs> you know, partake. Partake in this world. It doesn't tell us it's a world of idols meant to distract us away from be still and know. It's just go partake, partake. As if time is like a currency where the ego said, here, I'm going to give you a band of time of so many years between birth and death, and you can spend it any way you want. Have fun, enjoy. But there's a trick in the idea that time is ours to spend for anything we want. Because the ego is the belief that you can invent yourself and you can make yourself any way you want to be. And the spirit knows that, that God created us as perfect. And when we try to be opposite or different from the way God created us, we get into grave difficulties. We get, we get energized, we think, and we feel the thrill and the excitement of having a day to spend any way that we want. And yet, even retirees who have worked for decades to retire, oftentimes feel kind of paralyzed on their first day of not working. They're almost like, now what? They're so accustomed to the grind that when they're freed up from the grind, they're still, <laughs> they're still paralyzed. They still don't know how to spend their time, how to spend their money. They're still kind of like lost and wondering. So we need to get to the point where we can see it right now, how important this is, and give ourselves over to this. In fact, I always say that to everyone I meet, that we are lifelong companions on this journey back to eternity. And when we start to think of it that way, then we start to think, what can I contribute, what can I give to this pool of awakening that's happening, to this pool of beloveds that are turning away from the, the past and opening to the innocence, opening to the joy. How can we learn to collaborate together? How can we learn to join together in ways that support the whole? instead of survival, instead of just trying to individually survive. Even people over the years that have had communities and ashrams, they know that there is some value in sharing. Even in a, a big extended family. I think that's, you've got a bit of that going on here, don't you have a relative living in the back house? And here it is, we've got a little ashram going on here, ashram of sorts. And there's something wonderful about sharing. As opposed to everybody has to have their own individual space, and their own individual silverware, and their own individual <laughs> TVs. You see, the, it's like this sense of me, myself, my own, you know, that autonomy is not going to get us back into heaven. Nor is a sense of codependency, like, oh, I'm dependent on this person or that person, and I'm dependent on the government, I'm dependent on whatever. We're not going to reach heaven through autonomy, and we're not going to reach heaven through codependency, a false dependency on externals. We're going to reach heaven through intuitive inner listening, and growing strong in that intuitive inner listening, where we're so confident, where our yes can be yes, and our no can be no, where we don't have to, to fidget and waffle and hedge our way through the day, feeling, I hope I didn't upset them. We don't have the power to upset people. We have the power to upset our mind, ourself, but we don't even have the power to upset other people. That's the journey that we're taking. We're learning to take that. of what of the miracle is in, in the past, which was something that you can't do yourself, uh, but something that um, is like a gift, I guess you can say. But I, after I was reading the course recently, um, I had this kind of download that said, the miracle is the willingness and the ability to change your mind back to the truth. And 
I spent quite a bit of time working with the ego, and I still continue to do that, of course, but I'm finding more and more that I am sort of called on to acknowledge the truth that is true always, that is always there, the truth of who I am, and to let go of like when I'm feeling down or worried or fearful, to just recognize that as an untruth and move into the truth. And I find gradually that I'm doing that faster and faster. I wanted to know what is your definition of the miracle? Because it is the Course in Miracles. Yeah, it is the Course in Miracles. And there are the 50 miracle principles at the very beginning of the, the, the book. You know, oftentimes I do hear people talk about the miracle being like a shift in awareness, and you might say it's like it's shifting in a moment from from wrong mindedness back into your right mind. But I want to go deeper with that today. I want to go beyond the idea that a miracle is is a shift in perception. I want to go a little deeper because the miracle actually doesn't do anything. It's not like an active agent in the mind. In fact, at one point Jesus says, it looks and waits and watches and judges not. It's, he describes it in a, his workbook in extremely passive terms. Looks and waits and watches and judges not. That's, that sounds very passive. Even though we seem to be very active when we're miracle working, when we're involved in it. People have said, yeah, for someone who doesn't want to change the world, you're in a lot of countries, David. <laughs> it's giving a lot of talks for something that, that's already over and done. Uh, but it's, 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 this, it's the nature of, of seeing, just seeing the false as false. In other words, it doesn't take anything except the Holy Spirit to just see the false as false. But why does it seem so difficult to just see the false as false? It's that the mind has made a world of idols, and the images of the cosmos aren't the problem, it's the arranging of the images into hierarchies that's the problem. It's judgments that's the problem, it's preferences. Imagine the miracle has no preference for anything of the world. Why? It's because it does nothing. It simply sees the false as false. It sees all the images of the world as equally false. It wouldn't matter whether it was a walk on a sunny day or a nuclear bomb exploding. The miracle gazes upon the world with the same calm tranquility. It just sees the false as false. And to me that's, that's what this is about. It's, it, you might say it totally levels the playing field, it totally neutralizes everything, because it's only, it's only positive judgments and negative judgments that seem to make the idols of the world have meaning. And Jesus, you know, used the cross, the crucifixion, as just, just a teaching in that, that there was no order of difficulty in miracles, even in the most extreme example of a human being seemingly be put up on a cross with, with nails driven into their arms and legs, only to let, let the blood drip over hours and hours until death came. That was kind of an extreme teaching example. But his mind had already resurrected three years prior to that. The crucifixion, the day on Calgary, was no different than taking a walk with the Apostles on a sunny day and taking a swim in the lake. The, the cross was the same as taking this a walk on a sunny day. So, so the miracle, you might say, it's, it, it neutralizes the world. And a lot of times the ego will say, well that's boring. You mean you're going to go through this whole spiritual awakening just to have the world neutralized? That's in the end, you know, it's just going to neutralize everything. But the joy is in the identity that's not caught up in that judgment. The joy is in that identity that doesn't know what a hierarchy means. It is, the joy is in the sameness. The joy is, is seeing the world in a, in a, from a high state of mind that sees it equally as false. No longer is it tempted 
to be attracted to some things and repulsed by others, drawn into some dramas and repelled by others. You know, it, it's, it's just seeing the false as false. So, in one sense it does correlate with Buddha saying, empty the mind of all that you think you think and think you know. It's the same kind of neutralization that the Buddha was encouraging by emptying the mind. It's the same that all the sages from India have encouraged. Have a still, open, empty mind. That the truth cannot fit into this world. The truth will never fit into images. We can never make the truth, even pantheistic, we can't say that the, the truth dwells in this chair, or in this microphone, or in this carpet, or in this body. The truth is so transcendent, it, it is totally transcends all of the images, and all we're asked to do is be still and behold the world is false, and experience this extreme joy that comes from that, because that's as close to heaven as we can come in perception, is a state of pure non-judgment. Not that we're even capable of judging. You know, it's just taking us back to that original stillness and innocence that's prior to these categories and judgments. And that's the thing that's the most delightful, you know, that's what I've enjoyed the most, is, is just being able to behold the world. I'll be out traveling, someone will come and they'll sit with me, and we could talk about anything, it doesn't matter. I'm not concerned what they seem to believe in, because I've transcended this idea that beliefs are important, you know, that stories are important. Just to be able to behold the presence of love without having to debate. Imagine a state of mind where you could never get into an argument ever again, that you, you've had your last argument, and you go, I will never argue again. And, and why won't I ever argue again? Because I don't have a point to make. That this moment is the point. And we're sharing it right now. So, I'm not going to make a political point. People say, what about this candidate, that candidate? Ha ha ha. I don't know. I just don't know about that. What about the environment and the pollution environment? No, the present moment is the point. And we're already there. We can sink into the joy of this moment, realize that there really aren't any problems. All of our problems were hypothetical. Coulda, woulda, shouldas, what ifs. A mind full of what ifs, you know. After a while it's like, who wants to even use words talking about what ifs? You know, what's the point, <laughs> you know? I'd rather just bask in love and joy and happiness than that. We can learn from the animals. We can learn, we can learn from Happy, the dog, we can learn from the kookaburros, we can learn from all of these birds that are singing choruses. Down here in Australia, you've got great choruses of birds, I have to say. They just sing and sing and sing and laugh and laugh and laugh. And it's like God laughing with you, all around you. It, it's not hard to shift your mind to just, ooh, I like that. I, I can join with that laughter, the kookaburra's laughter. You know, it's, there's, it's not that far away at all when you think of it. And that there'll be a voice in your mind, the ego may try to come in with, well, that's all good, but it's not practical. But I'm saying, no, this is the most practical. It's impractical to get caught up into wheels of hypotheticals, of imagined futures. What if right here and now is truly all that we have to deal with? And, and we're, we can, we can deal with that. The ego says, you'll be sorry if you <laughs> let go of me as your guide and friend. You're going to pay a heavy price if you don't listen to this. I don't think so. I remember, it was over 20, it was probably about 20, 25, maybe 25 years ago, when I was just emptying my mind of all concepts, and I, this concept came up in my mind, and I looked at it, I had to stare at it for a while, because there was so much conditioning around it, and I had to really stare at it, and the concept was exercise. 
And Jesus is like, give it to me forever. I'm like, ooh, what if I atrophy? <laughs> what if I shrivel? You know, and he's like, give it to me, give it to me. I gave it to him. You know, I have not thought of exercise for the last 25 years, and it's been glorious. <laughs> I have not given one single thought to it. Have the muscles atrophied? No, they have not. No, ego, they did not. I, I quit thinking about exercise, and nothing bad happened at all. No sprained ankles, no torn ligaments. I, oh, I did a lot of exercise before. I played tennis, basketball, baseball. Sore this, sore that, sore this, heat this, rub this in. Work, 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 work. Oh, it's a strange ligament, blah, 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 blah. Sprained ankle, blah, blah. Now, that's back in the days when the ego was running the show with competition and, and wanting to have sport as a distraction to the stillness. That's why there were so many injuries and so aches and pains. But now, no. Before I would play tennis, I would always do like 30 minutes of stretching, stretching, <laughs> stretching, prepare, prepare. No. I was still exercising. No, I don't exercise. I don't even believe in it. I, I, people say, you believe in God. I say, I don't believe in exercise. Uh, but, but the best part of it is starting to see that there's no consequence. There's been no consequence to not believing in it. Nothing detrimental happened. And I think we can do the same when we get more confident. We can transfer it to food and, and nutrition. You know, it's like in the East they talk about the prana. You know, if, where do you go if you give up food and exercise? Prana. You know, that's the, the energy, the life force, you know, that's underneath all these concepts, is we've always got prana. In Jesus' terms, it was mana. It's interesting, the same sound, mana from heaven, mana, prana, mana, prana. That sounds like a meditation, mana, prana, mana, prana. It's beautiful, because it's like there's an energy that, that is a life force that's underneath all these images, that's actually real. And then the other stuff is just the veil that try to trick us into all kinds of crazy, circuitous routes of getting stressed out about nothing. Much to do about nothing, as Shakespeare talked about. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's what's so practical of this, that, that you know, you come and live on the mana from heaven, the prana within, and, and you feel a stress-free life. You know, you feel like you're constantly provided with that energy, that you don't have to do all these things to get it. Like it's radiating from the heart of who you are. It's, it's pouring out of the core of who you are, and you don't have to grasp and seek to try to get it. Which is what the world's all about. It's a lot of grasping for, for empty straws, and, and then going, what was I doing? Back when I was in graduate school, I had a, a cat that I named after Gandhi. I called him Mo, short for Mohandas Hey Gandhi. And there was a time when I was in graduate school, and I think I had like four or five finals, and I was like all stressed out from studying, and I was going crazy, and, and I went out to just sit in the backyard to take a break from the studying, and my cat came out, Mo came out, and we both sat there and we looked at the moon. And then Mo just turned over and looked at me like, what are you doing? <laughs> like you've got this, and you're in doing all these studies. Why was I doing all the studies? For what degrees? What was all the degrees about? What was all the money about? What was all the pursuit about? You know, Mo was just in this simplicity, was looking at me, watching the moon, and turning over to me like, you don't look well. <laughs> you don't look well. Look. It's like this look, and you know how a cat can look in the eye, like, you look stressed. Like, you look really stressed, in the back of the moon, like, the light, turn to the light. So, yes? So the idea that you have to be creative, you're supposed to be creative because God's creative, and that's something that you have to allow to happen with the Holy Spirit, rather than decide to be creative? 
Yeah, the, I feel a lot the of ego. people wonder what they should be doing. Yeah, no, they want to be creative. And so they're onto it. There's like a, there's a thread of truth in there. There's a draw towards creation and creativity, but the ego will hijack anything. It's such a clever little puff of nothingness. Uh, it will take the creativity idea and then it will make you stressful that you're not creative enough. Or not good enough to create. And it's been fun um, traveling with Sam and meeting my friend Tia and then my friend Mirabella, who are all good artists and amazing uh, paintings, glorious paintings pour through. And yet um, we got into the whole topic of, of commerce and selling paintings. When, you know, Abraham Maslow was an amazing teacher, a psychologist, who talked about the means and the end need to be together. So if you're truly following the artist way, you're in the joy of the moment of expressing whatever the form looks like, whether it's through dance or art, painting, photography or whatever, you're just in that moment of feeling like you're being done through. And you're loving it, you're just happy and content in that moment. But you're not thinking about, will it sell? How much money will it bring? Do I have another canvas, you know, to do the next one? You know, the business end of it. The ego will take anything that's gloriously simple and will try to hijack it and turn it into reciprocity. Yeah. It, as long as it can inject the poison of what will I get out of this, it can try to destroy in awareness the most happy, joyful, innocent, creative moment. And so that's how I felt about with the Course, you know, I felt like freely I receive, now freely I give, and it's been a joy, the travels and being spoken through and everything like this. But I wasn't really looking with the motive to get anything out of it. I didn't ever want to give over to that motive of what's in it for me, what's in it for David, because then it's, it's gone. So I would say, True creative expression is simply letting the spirit use the instrument of the body and, and the world in ways that bring a blessing to the whole. Like, like the flower giving off its fragrance, it's not trying to direct its fragrance and direct the direction of the wind where the fragrance blows. It's happy to give the fragrance. When we live our life that way, we are coming into, I call it forgiveness, and then the Course says God will take the final step. In other words, when you have a happy dream of being in that creative flow, where there's no resistance, then you're ready for return into true creation, which is pure spirit. Can I say something about that? It's interesting, I've always wanted to do creativity. I do some poetry and I do a little bit of painting here and there. But I always feel like it's not good enough, so I don't easily start. But I have a three-year-old granddaughter. And when she comes over, I just pull out the paints and I do anything, and I'm always amazed at what comes out. It's just, it's very simple, it's nothing sellable, but it, it's just like I'm in the flow, and when I'm doing it, I'm really happy, and I have no sense of this having to create, because I've got to create some kind of worth in the world, so something to describe myself by. So the joy in painting and doing creative things with a three-year-old has been the greatest teacher for me. Yeah. Because of that freedom, the, the fun of creating, but it not having to be anything. Yeah. And she's so joyful doing it. We splash paint and it's so good. Yeah. That's the feeling that I know is the true feeling. You're onto it. You're like zooming into it. Yeah. I had a friend that, from England that had rosy cheeks and she was always laughing at everything and she just was perpetual laughter. She was so high and so happy. And we were traveling one time and moving around and um, I said to her, Dorothy, I think you forgot your camera. And she said, no I didn't. No. <laughs> she was aware that her, her eyes were taking pictures of everything and she was beholding all the, the glory and the beauty. And she, she was so quick like that with everything, because everything for her was a state of mind, a state of consciousness, a state of awareness. It wasn't, it's so simple, you know, and, and she was aware that her eyes were continually just taking these amazing, glorious photographs. And, and sometimes people do 
find that when they lose the camera or whatever, they just start to go, drink it in, just enjoy the actual experience of it, and, and how beautiful that can be. And I feel like that's, that's it. You know, in the end, I think it's, it's, our creativity can be, it's just the state of mind. And doesn't that feel good when you don't feel any pressure to be a certain way, do anything? You know, you have one of those happy-go-lucky times in your life where you don't have any shoulds or ought-tos laid on you. You just give yourself full permission just to be. And then whatever comes from that state is a glorious gift. It's is a, a glorious gift. It's a job to get rid of the guilt. The feelings of guilt for not doing whatever you think you should be doing. Uh, but when I'm with my granddaughter, I don't have any guilt whatsoever. I'm doing, I'm just doing what's in our hearts. And uh, that, that is glorious. That's a glorious thing. There's no shoulds or oughts or musts. Yeah, if you even thought of the most glorious life you can imagine. Like, I look at the way it's gone for me over these 25 years and I have enjoyed the travel, meeting all the friends, just <coughs> being together, hanging out, just sharing the fellowship, the camaraderie, the just sharing the experiences from our hearts, un, unrestrained, being able to share what's ever on your mind, watching movies together. Has that been, I've had so much fun. Isn't it fun having some mighty companions around and watching really good movies? And sometimes there's so many delicious moments in the movie that you just have the remote control and you pause and you all go, Oh, isn't that good? Oh, you just pause the movie and you savor that. You can even do that now with songs and music. All, if you think about all the things that we can share, what a glorious, happy, carefree life to be able to share all these joys, the simple joys together. And really the props, there's just props and there's just stuff here for us to use to experience joy. It really has no other purpose. You know, and we know that, that we will reach a state of such pure joy that the world will eventually disappear. That was my favorite bumper sticker, life's a joy and then you ascend. <laughs> Instead of life's a bitch and then you die. Like, That's the Holy Spirit. Life's a joy and then you ascend. Well, we can find lots of ways to share the joy together. You know, I had people years ago that said, oh, come on, I want to be your playmate and do this and this. And so, I would meet somebody on the internet who I'd never met before. That was the fun thing about the internet. They'd contact you and email you and they'd say, come to my town, I'll take you to an amusement park, we'll go on roller coaster rides and this and this from a complete stranger. Instead of a dating site, you just join and go and then you start to feel things in your heart. You don't feel a fear of, you start to feel fear of meeting strangers. You want to just go and enjoy an experience. And this woman brought her daughter along and another friend and we all went on roller coaster rides. And for me that was good too because when I used to go on roller coaster rides as a child my, my stomach would get all queasy. But with all this mind training with the Course in Miracles I thought I can even go on roller coaster rides and not get sick. This is the best. <laughs> you feel the hair, your hair blowing and all the joy and brushing past you but there was no sense of queasiness or sickness. It's just the joy. We're just getting into more and more pure experiences of joy. And the rest then fades away. We're drawn into it. You're uh, 220. Okay. <laughs> we've, we've stretched it. <laughs> we've stretched it out a little. Well, thank you all so much for coming. It's such a joy to come back to Sydney, to be here with you. I look forward to more return visits. It's been a while since I've been here, but already I've got my, my plans to come back here in the end of October, and November's wide open. Are so, you leaving soon, or are you staying here for a while? This day? Tonight. tonight. Yes, I'm, I'm leaving tonight. I'm going back to Melbourne, and then I'm going to Brisbane on Monday, and then back over to North America. So it's a brief whirlwind. Yeah. <laughs>
You'll be back for a week in November. Yeah, a weekend down in Melbourne, an experience, October, and then November, there's yeah, all kinds of possibilities. Yeah. There's some information on the table out there. <laughs> and actually, this has been this year is a very spontaneous year. I mean, I had back in the 1990s, I had a very spontaneous life where I was just bebopping around and hip hopping around, da, 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 and then it was all very spontaneous. And then Jesus did say, "Well, I, most people are very into time, so I have to schedule you into their lives for retreats and things. They have to have some advance notice." And so I went through that phase. But this is more of a spontaneous year, so that, that I didn't really, I, I kind of felt Australia was coming, but I didn't know weeks or months in advance. I just kind of... You wrote to us two weeks before you were coming, I yeah. said, I booked a ticket. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I didn't even plan to do any speaking events, uh, mm. but it just happened. Yeah. So thank you for being a part of this happening. <laughs> it's been a glorious... I a glorious experience with you, and I love you all, and I'm mm -hmm. grateful to be here with you and to share this journey together, to feel that we're all in this together, we're not alone. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.